Let's make sure. Yeah, it's not muted. All right. So I want to make sure. Hey, good morning. How are you guys? Uh, I am back in the harbor after uh, just being gone for a couple of weeks. It didn't feel. It feels like a lot longer, but also it was a lot shorter with the birth of our twins. Um, if you have not seen that, I know I've been. I will be posting all that over Facebook and Instagram and spamming you guys with baby pictures. I'm gonna be that that person. So I'm sorry, Mike. Um, yeah, so I prepared myself. The minute you started doing dad jokes every week, I just like it's coming. The transformation's begun. Yeah. Oh yeah. Dad jokes full in. Um, I've already loaded up my gun, everything. Protect those two girls. So don't even get any ideas ever. Honestly, anybody. the final step is when you start making up your own dad jokes. That's my. That's well, what I'm done. I will. Hopefully. Oh, I'm sure. I hope I'm that creative. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll come. I am yeah. sure it'll come. Maybe. Hopefully. Uh, maybe Jesus is back before then, which will not be a bad thing <laughs> at this point. Man, that'd be great. Um, so, hey, we hope you guys are doing good. Um, we hope you are having a great morning. Um, enjoy the cooler weather this morning. It's going to be hot this afternoon. Uh, it's going to be forewarned. It's summer. Well, not technically. Summer comes this week, but it's hot. Hot and dry. So if you got a pool, you got a pool, Mike? I do, actually. Do you have a pool? Yeah, I do. Nice. Well, I, I don't have a pool. Do my parents have a pool. pool. Yeah, because Mike lives at home with his parents. That's because I'm lame. Yeah, all right. <laughs> a good silence there. Hey, please, today, if you would uh, leave some prayer requests um, or praises in the in the comments, um, the more comments we have on this video, the more people will see it. And, and um, But also, I want to pray for you guys. I, I've kind of been out of the loop. I haven't sent any emails for uh, two weeks, and you're probably happy about that. And I've um, just been, been at home and and so I'm adjusting now, so I'll, I'll try to be communicating with you guys. One thing I do want to communicate with you all is that the shirts are in. And so uh, this Wednesday night, which is your parents' formal night, right? So come dressed up um, in your how your parents would have gone to prom, all right? Oh, or, or, or whatever, huh? I've seen my dad wear this in your prom. I wear that. That'd be funny, though. I mean, you're not wrong. It'd be hot. But it's okay. Oh, and so so come come dressed ready for that, but you can pick up your shirts this Wednesday as well, if you haven't ordered a shirt, uh, the shirts, it's two for 25 You can bring 25 bucks this Wednesday, and we'll do that. Um, I really, We really need to sell uh, about 60 of these shirts to recoup all of our money um, on the shirts, which is it's just money, but still, we want to be good stewards. Um, and so um, if you, if you want to come buy your shirt, it's a great deal. These are great shirts. They're really comfortable. I've worn mine on the weekend. Um, one last night when I was working on a washer and dryer, which I didn't plan on doing, that just kind of naturally happened. Uh, but while I was out hanging out with Knox playing soccer, being athletic in the Fellowship 2020 Rex shirt, all right, which is a beautiful sea foam kind of turquoise green. Uh, it's good on my skin tone because I'm a ginger. Mike, I don't know about you, Probably but anyways, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful shirt. So you can come get that Wednesday, all right. Uh, so this Wednesday at seven o'clock. Really, if you want to come in a little early, it's great too. Uh, we start your parents' formal. And so we'll kind of hang out, play some nice 80s slow jams. Uh, we're going to have some worship. Lance will be back. He's been doing an awesome job at bringing the word. Uh, um, and then we'll have small groups. But after small groups, we have a bonus night. What is that, Mike? What are we doing this Wednesday? Do you remember? I do remember. Oh, we are having that hula hoop contest that you didn't do last week. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah, we, we did. Do, yeah, we we did ran do. out of time in the snow uh, cones. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, that, 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 that happens over you. We're having drive through night. Or drive in, not drive through. Drive in night. Not drive through. I mean, you can drive through, but uh, it is drive in movie night. Drive in movie night. We're going to watch Indiana Jones. Which Indiana Jones? Uh, I'm thinking. Uh, I really like the Last Crusade. I really like the Last Crusade. That's a good one. It's with Sean Connery. Um, really, I like all of them except for Crystal Skull. But you're not here for that this morning. You're actually here. Um, I'm here for that this morning. Oh, uh, for real? Okay. Well, sorry, Mike. I feel deceived. Yeah, you should. Uh, or you're just disappointed and confused and lost. That's my everyday. Dear. <laughs> I was going to make a joke, but I can't make a joke. Because that kind of is your everyday, Mike. So I'm sorry. That's real right there. That's not rehearsed. Um, that's real. I mean, that is on-the-spot comedy right there. Yes, yeah, it really is. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. Um, we're going to keep this pretty short so you guys are coming to church at 10.30. Would be awesome. Um, we'll, we'll give you plenty of time to, to watch or to be here at present and be if, back. If here. you show up at church at ten thirty, Blake will wave to you. Uh, I probably won't because I probably will be staying up above 
from the upper deck. Get away from you from the upper I'm deck. Trying to social distance when I can. Um, cause I have two premature babies at home. And so, yeah, but, but really, please, no one has hit up the messages, um, comments. Please do that. I, I want to pray for you guys and with you guys. Um, a fancy way of saying he misses y'all. Yeah, I want you guys to engage. Um, I don't want to be like normal Sunday school where y'all look like zombies. Uh, but anyways, so hey, what we're going to do, Isaiah 37 is a really long chapter. Um, and so I'm going to put up a graphic and a, a music a song. It's like three minutes, 50 seconds. I want you to please go ahead and read Isaiah 37 during that time. And then we'll come in and we'll hit these points. Um, and re- it's really cool. You'll see in Isaiah 37 is basically what we've been talking about uh, and what God has told you. Um, uh, Hezekiah, he was going to do, he does. Okay, and so um, we're going to see uh, the God of all creation break man. Uh, and, and and so there's some there's some really funny dialogue actually in Isaiah 37 uh, as well, and, and you'll catch that. So I want to play this video. It's just it's just going to tell you to read Isaiah 37, and it's going to have music over it. So please do that, and then we'll return.
All right, hey, we're back. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, yeah, okay, so are you sure? Hey, okay, mic, mic's on. Mic's on. We lost some viewers during that time of prayer and reading. They're still, they're still reading, probably. They're probably still reading. Still reading. It's okay. It's, 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 there's a lot there. Um, all right, so this morning, we're in Isaiah 37, all right? And so, also, please forgive me, as I was I have not devoted my full attention uh, to this chapter um, and to our study, uh, our book, as normal. Uh, but this morning, our, our, our main idea, our, our title is that God vindicates his honor over an arrogant foe. And if you read uh, this chapter, in, in, in kind of leading up to this, we just kind of really understand how arrogant Assyria is and, and historically was. Um, and and it's, just, it's just pretty funny. Um, and so the main idea this, this morning is the battle between God and the king of Assyria comes to a head, and God wins them effortlessly, symbolizing also Christ's defeat of our eternal enemies. And now, one thing like we need to understand is, is in in the context of things, before God defeats this enemy, like uh, Assyria has won basically all the territory like of Israel. Wants is understatement. They just like this. Yeah, they they took, but they didn't have Jerusalem. <laughs> and so this is this kind of like that's that Jerusalem, and we know um, if you pay attention to any kind of uh, world news, it's just a place of contention. It's like this desired place, um, and, but we see that this is the last place for, for the king of Assyria to kind of conquer. And and so in thirty seven we see this build up. You know, God's been giving these warnings to um, Judah to King Hezekiah. From Isaiah, and we finally see um, a good and faithful response from Hezekiah. Something that we really ought to mirror in our lives um, when we are facing some things. And so uh, we got we got uh, four points this morning, and we'll walk through these really briefly and walk through the applications of this chapter, which I think are really good. And this first this first point for you, if you're taking notes this morning, is we see Hezekiah's humility. And is disgraced, humbled, and he's seeking answers. And we see that in verses 1 uh, through 4, all right? And so, as soon as King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes and covered himself with a sackcloth, went into the house of the Lord. This is a very cultural thing. Um, like, to the removal of those things, it's just like, um, it's, it's humility. It's humbling oneself. We see the same picture with Peter when he sees Jesus after the resurrection. Like, He's just, he's just ashamed because he ran, um, and so he just takes it, takes it off, and just humbles himself before for Christ. Um, in American culture, in Western culture, we don't understand that at all. <laughs> we would probably have to re- reverse. We put on more clothes, you know. Um, uh, so we see that we see, um, and he said, Elikim, who was over his household, um, and, and we see because. For many unbelievers, the most powerful force in their shaping world is the military, right? We look at the power of, of countries and principalities by according to the military. And, and the United States has a very, very powerful military, um, like in that of what Egypt and Rome and the Babylonians and Assyria um, and the Moors, all of those historically great countries. Um, Egypt, right? Persia, Greece. Uh, I remember the movie 300, okay? It's fierce warriors. Um, but it seems that nothing can stop a conqueror at the head of an army sweeping across the earth, all right, to add to his realm, but God. And so that's what we see here. Uh, the king of Syria is coming and gunning. He's like, I'm, 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 I'm going to demolish you. I'm going to take everything because you deny, deny me and you, are, you won't fold to me. And so we see... What Hezekiah's response is, it's finally a good response. He humbles himself. He bows down. <coughs> um, thank you. Um, he's seeking answers. He, he, he's seeking help. And so we see that God has a zeal for his own glory in this, this section. And that God's zeal is for the purification of his people. So he wants them to come back to him. He wants them to run to him. He wants them to repent. He wants them to believe. Um, so he says, they said to him, it's verse 3, Thus says Hezekiah, the day is a day of distress, of rebuke and disgrace. Children have come to the point of birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. 
It may be the Lord your God will hear the words of uh, Reb Shekha, who uh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. And so we see um, that Hezekiah represents the godliest response we can have in a time of humbling chastisement from the Lord. We need to humble ourselves. We need to lay everything down before him. And then the next point we see is God's first answer. It's this, that fear not, the blasphemer will die. Right? That's good news. Right? Yeah, it is, but it's terrifying. It's here. terrifying. It great um, news. It's great news that God does not abandon his people. And God does not take lightly those who blaspheme his name, those who challenge him, right? Um, we see that throughout Scripture. It fits into the narrative. And it's the same for us today. We can hold on to that truth. Um, so we see God gets angry with uh, the king of Assyria's challenge. Like, God God is peaceful and he's love, but God is also a God of righteous anger and just, like being just. He's a righteous his, judge. Would you say he hit his trigger? Yeah, yeah, he, trigger, trigger point, right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me, guys. Through Isaiah, who is... Um, like the talking piece, the mouthpiece, the, the letter, the, the, the figure, the speaker um, to the people from God. God gives an initial answer to King Hezekiah, his inquiries, his prayers here in this section. And God commands Hezekiah and the remnant to not be afraid because God has heard the blasphemous words of the, underli- and of the underlings of the king of Assyria. All right. So God rules over mighty nations, as powerful as he rules over the sparrows. And he's able to move kings to do his will. Um, he says this, I am about to put a spirit in him, and he will hear a rumor and return to his own land, where I will cause him to fall by the sword. Um, with ease, God will move the heart of this king to his own destruction. So we see that God is working something uh, great. Um, he's, he's, he is laying the plans out before um, Hezekiah, he is, he's telling him through his prophet, listen up, it's going to be all right, it's going to be okay. And so he's going to die, he's going to fall by the sword. Um, and it's just fun, it's like, it, it's like, well, it's like a Shakespeare play. Really? That's what I was thinking. <clears throat> like, kind of like Hamlet. Yeah. It's kind of like Hamlet, like, we read this, like, just how the king um, of Assyria dies. <laughs> like, huh. And so if you're Hezekiah, you're probably like, Okay. All right, this, this God is actually pretty good. We've been idiots, you know. Um, so I really hope he's uh, not quite as chill as that. <laughs> like everything no, no. that's gone on, I really hope that he's a little more like, you know, just praise God for all that. Yeah. I mean, he, he literally had his back against the wall. Oh, yeah. I mean, but it, it, took, it took him getting to his back against the wall to get it to really that point. Did. And so my question is, how many of us is that, like, is that, how many of us does that take, how do I say this? <clears throat> it takes that for us to do the same today. For us to literally have our backs up against the wall before we're willing to praise God. Before we're willing to hand things over to Him. Um, my prayer would be that you don't wait um, for your back to be against the wall. To be boxed in like Israel was. <clears throat> to praise the Lord. And I feel like we're in that time today where you're, you're going to see that. You're going to see people who are boxed in. Um, it's kind of like, you know, when you put a lion in a cage and you have it in a corner, its only response is going to be to, is going to be to fight you. Um, and if you aren't prepared, if you aren't understanding of that, then you're going to be destroyed. And so today, I hope as a people, as, as believers, as a church, that, um, you guys are prepared, um, because some, some things are being pushed up against, and we as a church, we're being backed into a corner a little bit. I hope we're able to respond faithfully, but also with praise and worship to our God, and understanding that He is in control. But the same God that speaks here in verse seven: "Behold, I will put a spirit in him, so he, he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and, and I will make him fall. I will make him fall." Is the same God that we serve. Now, God is not our puppet. That's not what He was doing for Hezekiah. Um, this was not for Hezekiah's glory. This is for God's glory 
and God's glory alone. And so that's important for us to remember. When Hezekiah is coming before, before God, <clears throat> it's not to prop himself up as king, right? Look at me. Well, it shouldn't be. It, it's, to, it's really for God to display his power. He's saying, I, look, look, you guys have been disobedient. You have been sinful. You have not trusted in me. And look what has happened. You've been conquered. You have been thrown into exile. You have forgotten who I am. Uh, you have turned the temple into a place of something else. Yeah, you have built a wall. Right. You have, you, have run, you have run to your enemies for help instead of me. But, but I, being God, being, being um, just and righteous and zealous for my glory, am going to save you. And it's going to be miraculous. And so we see that. And then we, because, and, 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 and so we see, like, the king of Assyria, we can almost allegorize this, which is dangerous, but, like, the king of Assyria really does represent the world. It represents what the world is doing today to us with his blasphemy. We see that in verses 8 through 13. And it's just this letter, and it's funny uh, because we have, we see the whole picture. Like, whoa. It, it, but what he says is really not any different than a conversation that we could have in Starbucks. Well, could have had in Starbucks um, when you could sit in there and fellowship. And he says, your God is not any different. And this is the third point. Is the king of Syria's blasphemy is that your God is not any different. It is, is no different. And he goes through in verse 11, Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them? The nations that my fathers destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezepah, the Seth, sorry, uh, the people of Eden who were of Telassar. Where's the king of Hamath, the king of um, Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharim, the kings of Hannah, or the king of Eva? He's basically saying, where, where, where were their gods? Where are they at? They're all destroyed. And so, um, verse 8 to 13 represent the final warning of. Uh, of Sennacherib to Hezekiah, which is the king, uh, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and, and uh, Judas, per, Judas, uh, Judas, sorry, purchased ally in Egypt, has marched out to fight Assyria, lest Hezekiah should gain any confidence from this. Uh, the king of Assyria sends the letter recorded in this text. The letter reiterates the royal spokesman's blasphemies against the power of the Lord. But the letter gets far more insulting than the royal spokesman did. It basically says, do not let the God you are trusting in lie to you when he says he will deliver you from my hand. Shocking blasphemy. Not only does the king of Syria say that the God of Judah is impotent to stop him, but that God is a liar and a deceiver. And when he says he will deliver them, the bottom line, your God is no different than the gods of any other nation. That's uh, <clears throat> that a couple of right? want to leave the room because they did someone say something like that. Right. Yeah, that's a... Right, I mean... Like, we have to think, and when we're reading, it's really important to think of the context. These are Jews. <clears throat> These are people that have been delivered out of exile. They were brought into Egypt because of famine and were fed through miraculous work. Brought and delivered out of exile by walking <clears throat> on the bottom of an ocean, of a sea, who were, had bread rain down from heaven, who had water come from a rock, right, who had seen in Mount Sinai the, the, the commandments come down and heard the shaking and the quaking um, from God. Who These are the same people who came to the land of Canaan and saw these people, uh, these, these Nephilim, um, and were afraid. But then God struck down their leaders. And this over and over, you, you got to think of like, what this guy's saying, and this is mind blowing. But then I, I was, when I was reading this, I was just like, <clears throat> this sounds like so many conversations I've had with non believers. Your God is a liar. He's a made, he's a made up figment of your imagination. It, it's, it's a product of control created by humanity to control and puppet other people, which it's clearly, we, you actually don't ever see that in scripture if you read it. Yeah. You don't. It's, it's not a control factor. It's, a, it's a praise and worship. Um, it's obedience. Uh, it's faithful. It's trust. Um, 
And, and you see when people trust in Scripture, like when Hezekiah trusts in God, as in this, we see what happens, and it is a good thing. But Hezekiah, how does he respond to this? It's really helpful to us. I love this part. You know, just like we can really learn, like Hezekiah, man, made a ton of mistakes. Just, but we're no different. We, we are probably worse than him, honestly. Like when, we, when it comes to David, David and Goliath and Israel story, we're not David. <laughs> we're, we're, you know, huh? Wait, what? We're not David. We're Hold not on. David. We're Israel. We're Hold we're cowards. We're afraid, right? Yeah. 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 I can't even be sarcastic. No, no. It's just it's so like we look at Hezekiah. We're like, what a dummy. But we're like, man, that that's me. That's me. And so Hezekiah has this response, um, and it's it, he runs to God in prayer, and it, it's just like, man, okay, this, um, this. Is what we should do when we encounter these things. When we have someone challenging God and, and calling him a liar or a deceiver. Um, who, where is he? Like We have seen that these past two weeks with everything going on. We've seen the, the stance that, hey, the, God does not solve racism or he would have. Well, that's not, that's not true. We see in scripture. We see we are one race now through Jesus Christ. We are one heritage, united in one blood, um, coming from all places, all backgrounds, uh, uniquely in God's glory and power working through individuals and their story uniquely to be bought by one. Like we, we see there's an answer to that. We see that there is an answer to how we are created. We're all image bearers. Uh, we are all worthy of, of dignity and life. That comes from Scripture. That comes from the Word of God. Um, and, and that has real impactful truth. And so when we encounter these things today, when we encounter the hardships and these proclamations at us from the world, um, we need to have a response like that of Hezekiah, which is our fourth point, prayer. In Hezekiah's prayer, defend your glorious name, O Lord. We see that in 14 through 20. And, and you may have read that. He brings the letter. He brings the letter to the temple and he reads it and he prays. Um, it, and so it's one of those things that we, when we encounter those things, what is our first response? Do we, do we, boy, like, whoa, whoa. you know, like, bah, let me blast you on Facebook. You know, can let me talk. Can you do all that one more time? Like noise and everything. Oh, yeah. Cool, like, it's like the Woody, you know, oh, of yeah. Toy Story. <laughs> We've been watching a lot of Toy Story in our house. But or do, do you take what's been given? Do you take it and do you take it before the Lord? Do you seek wisdom? Do you seek um, what He's going to do? And so, being slow to respond, like slow to speak, quick to listen, quick to hear, and that's hard for us, especially because of the instant culture we live in. Um, and so, Hezekiah's response to this letter is one of the most memorable and faithful reactions in scripture. He takes the actual letter to the temple and spreads it out, all right, before the Lord, that he prays with great faith and passion. He understands that the far greater force in the universe than that of the tyrant kings is God's zeal for his own glory. He addresses God in covenant language unique to Israel and Judah. He says, Yahweh, Lord of armies, is is the God who made the universe and rules over every kingdom on the face of the earth. But he is also the God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. Hezekiah links the awesome power of God to the specific portions of Judah. As Isaiah will say a few chapters later, God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. It is in its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Hezekiah pleads with God to see and hear uh, the king of Assyria's blasphemies. He dismisses the proof that the Assyrians have cited and no God can stop them. He realizes that gods of those of other nations are nothing more than mere blocks of wood and stone. Hezekiah finishes by pleading with God for deliverance from the king of Assyria, not only for Judah's sake, but ultimately so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that God alone is truly God. <coughs> it's awesome. Got the mic right there. Yeah, just boom. Like, so, there's some real practical things we can learn there from, from 
from Hezekiah in, in Isaiah, you know, notes this is do we do we lay those things out before the Lord? Do we pray with understanding of who God is and who Jesus is and what He has done? Handing them all things. Um I mean, and I believe at this point it's really where Hezekiah gets some peace there in the temple with God. And he's trusting, he's fully trusting in him. But then we see, we see the verdict, right? The hammer is about to get laid down. Uh, the verdict comes down. That's our final point from the king of the universe. And we see this in 37 or 20 verses 21 through 38. Um, and it's basically like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just like, uh, God does a mighty work and he destroys uh, the people. God speaks to Hezekiah. Uh, he says, because you prayed to me about the king of Assyria. And God has not changed his plan because of Hezekiah's prayer, but rather God uses Hezekiah's prayer mysteriously to accomplish his preordained ends. And God includes Hezekiah ahead of time in what he's going to do. And so there are four parts to God's answer here. The first one, that God promises to judge the blasphemer. God promises to save his remnant. God promises to, to deliver uh, Jerusalem. And then God makes clear that he does all of this for his own glory. So God promises to judge the blasphemer. God turns the arrogance of the king against him. In effect, as what he says, don't you know who I am? Uh, don't you know what I've done to other nations? Why aren't you afraid of me? God, in effect, turns the whole thing around. Don't you know who I am? Don't you understand the infinite power at my disposal? Why aren't you afraid to blaspheme me? This is his response to the king of Assyria. Then God discusses uh, the centerpiece of the king of Assyria's argument his recent history of military conquest. The king of Assyria has made outrageous claims, ascending mountains with his chariots, chopping down the cedars of Lebanon, uh, drying up the Nile by merely stepping in it. Now God pulls the curtain back and reveals the sovereignty of his rule over the nations of the earth. God asserts that all of their military success have been preordained uh, in his eternal plan. It is not only that they won because the gods of the nations are merely idols, they won because the God of the Jews ordained it. God ends by threatening the king of Syria with personal destruction because of his personal blasphemy. Um, in verse 28, it says that God tracks every single moment of his life and knows everything he is doing. If king of Syria heard this prophecy and took it seriously, he should have been thoroughly unnerved. This verse is a clear threat from an omniscient, omnipotent God, and God will drag him back to Syria by the nose, and, they will, and there have him assassinated by his own son. Ouch. Yeah, like, I'm telling you, it's Hamlet. It's like, <laughs> like... You don't have to try to convince me. <laughs> like, it's just like, man, you said, basically what God says is this. These things happen because I allowed them to happen. Now, they happen from the evil of your heart because no evil comes from God. Right? They happen from the evil and sinfulness of your heart. And they only happen because I allowed it. So that... So that I may display my glory and power over you. So I may humble you and your people. So I may prop myself up. So my, my people, those, uh, my chosen race, the Israelites, will run to me. They will see that I am the protector. I am the provider. I am the sustainer. I am the God of all things. And so you have to think, um, if we're thinking about making a statement, Right, Mike, like, how much more convincing is a statement if you defeat, let's take college football, if you beat the number one team versus an unranked team? People believe a lot more oh, yeah. when you beat the number one team who has gone through all these, these, these things and built themselves up to that prop. It's even proven in statistics that right. that happens, the enrollment rate just goes up. Right. Like, people like, oh, then they're good. Oh, yeah. They're better. Who who you played? Because God could have stopped it from the beginning. But what his people... Like if you if you if you look at the narrative, we you gotta know the heart of man, and so we're kind of at another one of those points today, like in history, and, and it happens over and over. And again, it's not wrong to say that the Messiah, the King, is coming soon, because um, it's never been wrong to say that, because he is, he is coming. Um, but we're at one of those points today um, where I believe God is calling out to His people to say, "Trust in Me, lean to Me." Pray to me. I've already 
ordained these things, but I've ordained these things so that you will run to me, run to the Father. And so some of the applications that we have from this chapter, um, God's glory is the uppermost in his own affections. Therefore, God's actions are first for his name and second for human salvation. So God works things for him first, a second. God's power and knowledge are awesome. God is sovereign over the nations, as we see. He rules over the hearts of kings. The human heart is arrogant. Amen. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So get low. All right? Um, yeah. God answers humble prayer. God's wrath is terrifying. Amen. God's mercy to sinners is amazing. Amen. And so each of these things we could preach on, we could talk, we could, we could do a sermon series of all these things. But the final word, the true tyrant, the true tyrant threatening the people of God is sin rolling in death. Right? God dispatches his only begotten son, uh, the big JC, defeats this terrifying foe, right? Not by killing, but by dying. To him alone be the glory. And so this morning, let's remember that. Let us find our hope in him and him alone. Guys, we love you. We thank thank for you. We hope to see you at church. Um, <coughs> this Wednesday night, you know, come dress to impress your parents formal and drive in movie night. So uh, bring your popcorn. We'll have water and stuff like that. Um, we will, um, you know, give a, a crown and sash for the best dressed for uh, your parents formal. So we'll have uh, the fellowship camp June, or I think you guys have been calling it June camp. Um, uh, king and queen, all right, for the best dressed um, for that one male, one female. You know, if you if someone wants to wear like a suit with some like suit shorts or something like that, that'd be kind of funny too. That would um, that'd be my favorite. Part I like to see Mike in a '90s suit with some aviators, real baggy, thin little eyes. I say that because of you I, know. like like Miami Vice. You're, because you already know I have aviators. That's yeah, <clears throat> just like real thick hair. But anyways, hey, we love you guys. Um, we're thankful for you. We're thankful for your heart. Uh, we're praying for you. Uh, can't wait to see you on Wednesday. Uh, may God be with you through all things. We'll see you.